This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. She had just turned 15 when her family all moved to the Rock. I could call it an island. It is an island, but to say Ida Lewis and her family moved to an island might leave you with the wrong impression and put the wrong images in your head. She and her family moved to a rock, a craggy bump of New England limestone poking out of the water in the middle of a narrow neck of Narragansett Bay off Newport, Rhode Island. Just big enough for a modest lighthouse and a modest regular house for a modest family. Her father was a sailor. He piloted a revenue cutter for the U.S. government doing customs enforcement. A strapping sea captain in Ida's youngest days, but he got old fast. Had a bad heart. And in his early 50s, he had to come ashore. It was 1854, and he was assigned to the new lighthouse on Lime Rock. And you should know that Lime Rock is just a few hundred meters from the mainland on one side. Because there will be times in the story when you might picture Ida Lewis all alone in the middle of nowhere. There may be times when you'll be swept away and it will seem like this lighthouse is away from all civilization, beset by forces natural and existential. So keep this picture in mind. A white lighthouse, a white house, on a white rock, just offshore from a bustling seaside town. Close enough, in fact, that every morning Ida could take the weathered rowboat down from the hooks where it hung on the side of the weathered white house and row her younger sister and brother across the channel to go to school in town. School was done for Ida. And then she'd return to Lime Rock and help her mother get the house in order and her father get the light ready for the night before taking the boat down again to pick the kids up and row them back. About a thousand feet in each direction as the gulf lies. But longer often, depending on the tide or current or the chop in the channel and her angle of attack. There were days her parents would watch their teenage daughter, small and slim, port their younger children across treacherous winter waters and marvel at her skill and her strength. The way her dress, soaked by the spray, clung to the muscles in her broad shoulders or her wrists as they worked the oars. And how she always seemed to know just what to do to keep the boat steady. How she could just press on and keep rowing when the sea was breaking over her. She rowed the channel every morning, even after her father's stroke. It came just four months into his job and left him unable to get up and down the stairs to the light, unable to heft the buckets of oil, or row to town for supplies, or clean the chimney or polish the glass, or do much of anything but sit in a chair by the window. So at 15, Ida Lewis became the keeper of the lighthouse on Lime Rock. But Ida Lewis was just a kid. Ida Lewis was just a girl. But her parents knew she was just the girl for the job. In this job, undertaken in the summer of her 15th year, when the sun shined in the waves and colored the whitewashed lighthouse in the late afternoon, when the water that broke against the rocks cooled the salted air. This job would be her life. Each day, each night, every day, every night, the same duties for decades. To row to and fro across the channel, all the upkeep, the sealing and resealing, the caulking and painting and Mending things, weather-beaten and water-worn and mildewed. Polishing the lens, dusting each bevel, while crouched in the glassed-in box that housed the light at the top of the tower. Wiping soot and salt from each window pane, front and back, each morning to prepare for the night ahead. A night that comes sooner as summer fades, and you need to work faster. Get your siblings off to school in the dark and the cold to come back in time to trim the wick and sweep the chimney and measure out the oil and heat it to thin it out in winter when it got viscous and would burn dimly and too fast. And keep inventory and keep records and fill out forms and purchase orders and incident reports and go up and down the spiral stairs and up and down in the heat and the cold and the rain and the snow and the spring breeze that caught the smells of the shore, flowers cut grass and brought the sounds of the shore out to the world of the rock and mingled with the smell of the sea and the sounds of the sea. And how well does one know the sounds of the sea when one keeps a lighthouse and a rock within it? And how well does one know the ways of the waves and the wind and the spray and the light and the water at all hours and all seasons in their infinite ways? Anyway, some days were different. One day, in the end of summer day, some teenage boys, boys her age, Sons of the wealthy families who'd just begun to summer in Newport back then. Took out a sailboat one last time before returning to school for the fall. 
And Ida, the lighthouse keeper's daughter, now the lighthouse keeper herself, could hear them playing as she worked. And heard them horsing around as they passed by. And then arguing as the waves picked up and swamped the boat. And shouting as it capsized. But by then, she was already pulling her rowboat down from its hooks and hefting it into the water and, and rowing on as it broke over her and saved those boys from drowning or being dashed upon the rocks upon which she lived. They didn't tell anyone because they didn't want anyone to know they'd been saved by some girl. Ida didn't tell anyone because she was just doing her job. And the days went on and the nights went on. Got her siblings off to school, got the light ready for the night, kept it glowing till dawn, and the days went on and the nights went on. And then one night, early March in 1869, she had just turned 27, had just finished her 12th year, some 4,300 days in the job in the rock. There was a squall, just another squall, just more whipping wind and white caps, frigid spray that froze in your hair. On this night, as her light shone through the sleet and the frost on the window panes, she heard cries over the usual howling. Her father called out from his chair by the window, a boat off the point by Fort Adams. He could barely make it out, men in the water. He called to his daughter, but she was gone, out into the storm in her nightclothes, only a towel for warmth wrapped around her neck, already on her way, back straining, pulling against the current, oars slicing through the water, keeping steady, Waves breaking over her head, hands freezing, bitten with frost, muscles burning as she pushed through the storm. When the men, two soldiers stationed at the fort, would remember the terror of that night and the storm that took their boat and the life of a boy they'd recklessly paid to take them through the channel despite the dangers so they could make curfew after a night out carousing. When they told the story, they remembered seeing a boat in the water, saw it flash in the light from Lime Rock as it crested each wave and then plunged down into darkness on its way toward them. But they were crestfallen, were sure they were doomed when they saw it was rowed by a woman, who could never make it to them in time, would never be strong enough, could never haul them into the boat, could never row them back to safety. But yet here they were, alive to remember the heroism of Ida Lewis. 4th of July, 1869, was Ida Lewis Day in Newport, Rhode Island. And in lieu of a celebration of the glorious Union, reunified just four years before at the end of the Civil War, 4,000 people gathered to praise the girl keeper of the Lime Rock Lighthouse. Many in the crowd had known her for years. Knew her from school back when she went to school, or from her daily trips into town. Or they knew her in passing, truly, having seen her up in the loft in the lighthouse, or out repairing her battered old boat as they sailed by in theirs. But many more knew her from the articles. Not just the ones in the local paper who had dug up stories of other rescues heretofore unreported, but the ones in national magazines, too. They had seen the etching on the front cover of Harper's Weekly. Ida Lewis, just over five feet tall, just over a hundred pounds, on a windswept rock, a roiling tempest behind her, but her gaze fixed ahead, arms crossed, jaw set, a look in her bright eyes that seemed to tell the illustrator to speed it up. She had work to do. The soldiers' rescue made their rescuer famous in two ways that were brand new in 1869, nationally and seemingly overnight. And so on an overcast summer day, her morning's work behind her, still enough time to row back and light the light and start her night. Ida Lewis listened to speeches made in her honor, saw girls, saw women dressed like she'd been on her Harper's cover, black dress, white kerchief tied in a sailor's knot around her neck. She saw concessioneers hawking tchotchkes with her name and her face and the lighthouse she kept printed on them. And then she was presented with a new boat, paid for by a group of donors that included Ulysses S. Grant, hero of the Union and President of the United States. And when she was asked to speak to her adoring crowd, she had few words beyond thanks. She didn't like crowds. And besides, there was work waiting for her back on Lime Rock. That summer, 9,000 people came to see her. You could pay someone to row you out, or have your man pull up your yacht and then shuttle you over. 
There were Astors and Vanderbilts, and admirals and railroad men in for the summer season, the leading lights of high society, who couldn't resist the chance to meet the famous Ida Lewis, the humble girl who'd so quickly come to embody American bravery and duty. Not that they ever invited her to visit them. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton formed the National Women's Suffrage Association, and the very next day they came calling on Lime Rock and tried to recruit Ida Lewis as the public face of their cause. She was the hero American women needed, but Ida demurred. She didn't like crowds, and besides, there was work to do. But again and again that summer, she would have to take a break from that work to greet or to humor this dignitary or that. But of course, most of the many thousands who came weren't famous. Some days, in between the cleaning and the dusting and the wick trimming and the paperwork and all, she'd shake 600 hands. It could be too much. Well, people could be too much. Photographers would make her sit. People would get the house dirty. Some people would steal things. But most people were kind. Just folks with boats and daughters who wanted to see their heroine in the flesh. But summer would end and the weather would turn and the wind would blow cold and the nor'easters would roar in and it would all be for the best. Her admirers would stay on their side of the water where they could look out to the lighthouse and know that Ida was out there. A symbol of an all-American type of virtue. Yankee pragmatism mixed with audacious daring do. A light for them all. A living metaphor. And she could stay on her side of the water and get back to work. There were songs and poems written in her honor. She received medals and gifts and marriage proposals. She did marry. A sea captain who had come and kept his ship in the slip in the docks just across the channel from Lime Rock. They were engaged for three years while he was at sea, and when he returned to claim her, she left the lighthouse behind for family life on dry land. But the marriage didn't make it two years, and she went back to her light. She said there was peace in the middle of the sea that she couldn't find on shore. She said the light was her child, and her life was taking care of it. And she took great pride in knowing that taking care of it mattered, that it kept people safe. Best we can count, she saved 18 lives with her own hands. The last of those that we know about came when she was 62 years old. There were likely more, but she didn't like to talk about the rescues. It was all in a day's work and all. One of her duties no more vital than the cleaning or the caulking or dusting the lens or preheating the oil in winter so it would last through the night, every night. The last of those nights was in October of 1911. She collapsed with a stroke the next morning. Her death was international news. Full page tributes. Her funeral was massive. Crowds lined the streets. Flags flew at half mast. Businesses shut down for the day. One of the boys, one of the rich kids she'd saved when she was just a kid herself who hadn't wanted anyone to know that he was saved by some girl, was one of her pallbearers. And let's just pause a second to picture him there. A man in his late 60s, in a suit and a tie carrying that coffin, knowing that the woman whose body he bore had given him his last 50 years. The sermon was a lovely thing. The reverend worked the Ida Lewis as shining light in the darkness angle for all it was worth. And who could blame him? He praised her courage and how she plunged into perilous waters again and again. She would have hated going to her own funeral. All the pomp and the pretense. She never liked crowds. But she would have pressed on and kept rowing while the sea crashed over her. There was work to do. This episode of The Memory Palace is produced by me, Nate DeMeo, with engineering assistance from Elizabeth O'Bear. Eliza McGraw is my research assistant. This show is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. We get our ad music from J.D. Sampson. If you are in the Boston area on November 1st, 2018, and want to see a Memory Palace live show, please do. 
It is a night of stories and music and pictures and surprises, and it is unlike just about any other live podcast show out there. You can find a link to tickets to that show at the Somerville Armory on November 1st at thememorypalace.us slash events. I would love to see you there. And if you ever want to write to me, I would love to hear from you. You can send me an email at nate at thememorypalace.us. Talk to you guys in a couple weeks. Radiotopia.